Hi and welcome. Another year, another Murdoch Music Minute. The disoriented, slightly schizophrenic channel that gives you album reviews, discography rankings and all that comes with it from various genres and decades. For this episode, I'd like to take a look at one of the giants in pop and rock. If you've clicked intentionally on this video, I probably don't need to tell you a lot about the artist in question. However, as always, before I get into the music on the album, I will give you a brief overview of the artist's career up to uh, the point of the album I'm going to talk about. So, um, get your makeup, get out your outrageous designer clothes, question your identity if you like to. Here comes the pop chameleon. David Bowie, born as David Robert Jones, grew up in a middle-class family in London. He was a creative and imaginative child early on, interested in music, dance and theatre. Enthused by classic rock and roll and later on jazz music, the young David Jones decided to learn an instrument himself. After first groups in the early 60s playing blues and rock and roll covers, he found a manager who motivated him to write original material. Around the mid-60s, Bowie took on his now-famous stage name, partly to avoid confusion with Davy Jones from popular TV pop group The Monkees. First singles with various bands did not meet with success. With a new manager, Bowie released a first solo single, the infamous absurd and whimsical baroque pop of The Laughing Gnome, and a debut album to little effect in 1967. Bowie afterwards concentrated on studying dramatic arts, but never fully gave up music, making friendship with rising star Mark Bolan from Tyrannosaurus Rex. Bowie's second album contained the famous Space Oddity. On release, the slightly psychedelic folk rock album also was no success, despite its relatively popular single – leaving Bowie frustratedly looking for an artistic expression and direction to gain more public attention. His next two albums, The Man Who Sold the World in 1970 and Hunky Dory from 1971, varied drastically in style but still were rather underground records. Meanwhile, Bowie's predilection for roles, aliases and artificial characters an interest in outrageous costumes and the play with one's sexual identity all came together to finally bring forth the concept of an androgynous rock and roll alien, Ziggy Stardust. The concept album from 1972 and accompanying tour finally put Bowie on the map, now as leading figure of the glam rock scene alongside his artistic rival Mark Bolan. But the success almost totally absorbed Bowie, stifling his creative freedom, so that he decided to leave the Ziggy character behind at the height of its popularity. Fascinated by American proto-punks Iggy Pop and the Stooges, the highly anticipated follow-up to the iconic Ziggy album would become a rougher and darker version of Bowie's glam rock style. Ziggy wasn't dead yet, but he found himself as... Aladdin Sane in a rather dystopian world. For Bowie fans, this album review will probably feel a little bit like starting a movie series with the sequel, but being me, I sometimes simply tend to pick out the less obvious choices over the well-known classics. Of course, the concept album about Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, the guitar-playing Alien, is the more popular and uh, well-known release. But, arguably, Allard Insane is the more iconic album, at least as far as its cover design is concerned. The photograph of Bowie on the front with his red-haired, uh, futuristic 1970s mullet, the flash makeup splitting his face and the silvery tear running down his collarbone 
certainly is one of the most iconic portrayals of David Bowie, or rather of um, one of his characters. The front cover seems to display everything that this album is about. It's glittery, it's slightly alienating and futuristic, and it seems to be steeped in sadness and a certain mental instability. It's the breakdown of the Starman torn by fame. For the first time in his career, Bowie was breaking it big in the USA and this American adventure or experience uh, from the US tour with uh, the Ziggy shows is reflected on Aladdin Sane. And um, very obviously, it's an ambivalent and rather exhausting experience on Bowie's side. This album is Bowie's boisterous take on rock and roll. However, it very often is a slightly unsettling and perverted version of rock and roll that we are presented with. The album begins with Watch That Man, a forceful rock and roll stomper. It has got loud electric guitars, saxophone, honky-tonk piano, very powerful background vocals. So all the main ingredients of good mid-1970s glam rock. And um, Bowie seems to channel the Rolling Stones on this track, not the only moment on the album where he does so. Watch That Man also obviously is a challenge to uh, his glam rock rival Mark Bolan, who at the same time was riding a huge wave of fame and popularity in the UK with his band T-Rex. The ambivalent, unstable mood is already established with this first track. It seems to describe a chaotic party debauchery and it's about the star who appears and is the center of attention at uh, the party, uh, the man who takes care of the room as Bowie sings on this track. After this stomping intro, the next track is the title track, Alad Insane or Alad Insane, whichever way of pronunciation you prefer. This is quite a different beast. Um, it's a very experimental art rock track, almost. Somehow lush, but very cold, not easily accessible, um, quite alienating. It's mostly dominated by the piano playing of Mike Garson, who was an American jazz pianist Bowie invited uh, for the sessions. And allegedly, uh, Bowie also really pushed Garson uh, to play as unrock and roll as possible on this track. There is a very dissonant, expressionist piano solo that more or less defines this number and also a few other uh, tracks on the album. In the lyrics, Bowie again speaks of th images of things that don't really seem to fit together. Um, for instance, um, there's talk of champagne and battle cries. Um, so you again get this very unsettling, ambivalent uh, imagery. Um, a combination of debauchery, um, a manic mood, and then at the same time aggression and, and also um, disillusionment. Either Bowie is speaking in character here, or there's a more personal background to the whole feel and theme of the album, uh, because maybe Bowie himself as an artist on tour, an artist uh, for whom there was a lot of demand at that time, felt like mentally maybe he was uh, going off the rails a little bit. It's also interesting to note 
that Bowie had a half-brother who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and maybe uh, some of that also um, somehow consciously or unconsciously uh, poured into the lyricism on this album and uh, this particular song. Allard Insane is a remarkable uh, piece of music and it's definitely the very heart of this album. <laughs> Things become more tuneful with Drive-In Saturday. This is a 1950s inspired glam rock catchy tune. The song with saxophone hand claps and um, a very catchy chorus, however, is just a vehicle um, for a rather dystopic story about a society after the nuclear fallout. So again, Bowie apparently uh, seems to have been in a bit of a paranoid mood while writing the material for the Aladdin Sane album. However, this didn't stop him from coming up with this absolute glam rock classic. This almost constant feeling of paranoia and claustrophobia is underlined by the next song, Panic in Detroit. On this one, a Bo Diddley or Rolling Stones groove is given the glam treatment. The lyrics are about chaos and violence in a grim urban setting apparently uh, influenced by unrests in the USA. So uh, Bowie's look at America on this album is not a sentimental or heroic one. Guitarist uh, Mick Ronson can crank up his guitar on this track. <laughs> The final song on side A is called Cracked Actor. It's another quite snotty, grim song. It talks about prostitution, failed stardom and alienation as the current themes on this album. Again, it's like a very dark version of T-Rex. Everything here is a little bit distorted and depraved. Mick Ronson again has a fiery, very distorted guitar solo going on. And add to that the very sexual overtones of the lyrics that Bowie spits out um, in this recording. It's a very interesting and unusual track for 1973. Side 2 starts off a little bit more relaxed, at least musically, with the tune Time. And uh, this one has got um, a bit of a cabaret or vaudeville atmosphere or sound. Uh, Mick Ronson gets a prominent guitar solo here. Other than that, uh, Mike Garson's piano is again the central instrument of the song. The theatrical quality of this tune is enhanced by um, a very noteworthy uh, theatrical vocal performance by Bowie. In this song, um, he talks about mortality. Time here, again described with sexual connotations, um, becomes something very disillusioning and threatening. Time is followed by The Prettiest Star. Um, this track maybe comes closest to uh, the overall sound of the predecessor album Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Um, it picks up the futuristic look back at uh, 1950s doo-wop again and thus is the most um, immediate tune on the album. Maybe that's also because um, a first version of The Prettiest Star um, had already been done by Bowie several years before and, and this track is I think 
a welcome ray of positivity on this album. A lot of fans and critics to this day are rather irritated by the song that follows, a cover version of the Rolling Stones' Let's Spend the Night Together. But this one is a wild, chaotic and dissonant version of this raunchy Rolling Stones classic. Bowie uh, turns in a very manic, almost desperate vocal performance. It's, uh, it's really a skewed cover version of uh, Rolling Stones rock music. Uh, again, lending the music an air of uh, depravity and schizophrenia. When in the right mood, I think I get what Bowie wanted uh, to do with this cover version. But um, yeah, overall, usually I prefer the original by the Rolling Stones. Well, that Bowie could write rock classics himself is demonstrated right away with the next track, The Gene Genie. Here a chugging, almost stubborn blues boogie riff is used to great effect. Um, it is the most fun entry on this um, otherwise rather disturbing album. In the lyrics you can feel Bowie's enthusiasm uh, about the big American cities, most notably New York, but uh, also um, it talks about a certain overwhelming and yeah, almost um, threatening effect of uh, the huge metropolis. Allegedly, uh, the song is also about Iggy Pop, and I think it is deservedly one of the most popular David Bowie singles to this day. And we are on to the final track of the entire album, Lady Grinning Soul. This song finally gives the listener a little bit of space to breathe. It's uh, very lush and relaxed compared to everything that went before on Aladdin Sane. There is some really beautiful lush piano playing, acoustic guitars and some very longing uh, vocals from David Bowie. Um, this song is not very, it's not easy to decipher. Um, again, it has clearly sexual overtones. It seems to talk about um, a seductive woman or the seductive femininity in general, sometimes in almost psychoanalytical terms. Um, but um, as a song, I think this is a really great track and a fantastic way to close um, this unusual and remarkable album in the Bowie discography. She'll Ballad Insane was released in 1973 at a point where, I think, but I might be mistaken, Bowie had already announced during a live concert that this was the last time he would ever appear as Ziggy Stardust, or actually he said this was his last concert ever. Um, the album Ballad Insane um, is one of his commercially most successful albums. Uh, it's also one of um, his most successful albums, at least in the US Billboard charts. So it fared very well, maybe not with the same staying power as Ziggy Stardust. And um, by critics, it was very often unfairly compared to Ziggy Stardust and rather treated as a bit of a directionless, um, lesser version or lesser sequel to uh, the Ziggy Stardust album. Well, I'll come out here and dare say that to me um, this is a stronger and more exciting album than its predecessor. 
yes, there's no conceptual story running through the album, but rather it deals with certain themes, as mentioned, madness, disorientation, uh, and also alienation, alienation by fame and stardom, or maybe also by a rather intimidating society. The songs on Aladdin Insane are musically intriguing, sometimes challenging, but also uh, very often quite catchy if you give them some time. So um, if you also um, rather treated this album as a bit of an inconsequential uh, follow-up to Ziggy Stardust, um, re-listen to it uh, if you've never listened to this one and just are just familiar with um, Ziggy Stardust, um, then listen into this album and um, definitely give it a try. On that note, thanks most of all for listening to me yet again. We'll see each other, maybe, in the next video.